I want to start this morning by asking you a question. I would think it would be an easy question, but it's rather complex. What is the greatest characteristic of Christianity? When you think about that question, what comes to mind? What is the greatest characteristic of Christianity? To love. That's good. Humility. To experience humility. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. That's the one I was looking for. All those are true that you shared. But the true characteristic that separates Christianity from all other religion is the forgiveness of sin. No other religion offers the forgiveness of sin by grace. All other religions would have you earn your way into a favorable position in afterlife by your works here in this life. That would include Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and even Judaism. The forgiveness of sin is exclusive to followers of Christ. Only Christianity offers that. Only Christ offers that. And this morning we're going to look at a text that's actually recorded in three different Gospels. It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The synoptics, they call them, because they're similar. But if you want to turn to Mark 2, it has the longest recording of this event. But as we go through it together, I've compiled what I call, or what they call, a Gospel Harmony where you'll get all the details being read to you, so some things won't be in your text. They'll come from Matthew and Mark. Or, I'm sorry, Matthew and Luke. Starting in chapter 1, or I'm sorry, in starting in chapter 2, in verse 1, Mark records, A few days later, Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and entered in again into Capernaum. The people heard that he had come home. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and from Jerusalem were sitting there. So many gathered that there, were, there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. And the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four of them on a mat, and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof, digging through the tiles, and lowered the mat the man paralyzed was laying on, right into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, or Luke calls him friend. Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the scribes, began thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, Why do you entertain evil thought in your heart? Which is easier? To say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, He paused, and then He turned and looked at the man, looked at the Pharisees, I imagine in my mind. He said, Get up, I tell you. Take your mat and go home. Immediately, the paralytic stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, walked out in few, full view of all of them, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God who had given such authority to men. They were filled with awe and said, We have never seen anything like this. We have seen remarkable things today. Okay. That was the gospel harmony. There are some 
commentaries about what happened in this uh, section of text, in this account that Mark and Luke and Matthew records. Um, one of the early church fathers was named St. Clement of Alexandria. And what he said was, for a while, the physician's art, according to Demetrius, is that the physician heals the diseases of the body, and wisdom frees the soul from passion. But the good instructor, the wisdom, the word of the Father who made man, cares for the whole nature of creation, the all-sufficient physician of humanity, the Savior, heals both body and soul. Jesus takes care of both. Barry L. Blackburn suggests that this story teaches our heart to anticipate with ecstasy the day spoken of Isaiah so long ago. And this is what Isaiah writes. He says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. The ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leak, leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. Now, Dr. John MacArthur, in his commentary, he suggests that this paralytic man came for healing, but not of his physical body. He came for forgiveness of sin. And what we need to understand is this culture viewed sin and physical infirmities as linked together. One caused the other. In their view, if you had a physical infirmity such as blindness or paralysis or leprosy, you were being punished by God for your sins or for your parents' sins. That was the view of culture. We don't view it that way anymore. We know that there are consequences in this life for sinful living, correct? If we drink and drink and drink and drink alcohol, it'll have an effect on our liver. We might even get cirrhosis. If we smoke 10 packs a day, we might develop lung cancer. There are all kinds of things that we can do to our bodies that are sinful and not treating our bodies like a temple that will have consequences of physical infirmity. There's no doubt. It's linked together. But we don't necessarily assume that God is punishing us for our sins. The punishment comes at judgment. But in their culture, sin was viewed as synonymous with, sick, with sickness. And there was a social stigma that accompanied any physical infirmity. For instance, this paralyzed man likely was carried, probably by these four same friends, to one of the gates at the temple, and he laid there all day, begging, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. And people might, in the goodness of their heart, throw him a coin. That was his way of existing. Okay? There were no medical um, facilities available to those that were handicapped. Nothing was handicap accessible. And to have an infirmity in their minds, in those people's minds, meant that you were guilty of sin. God was punishing you. So you were socially ostracized. You were medically physically ostracized, so much worse than handicapped people today are even ostracized sometimes because uh, accommodations haven't been made. Or we look down on them for whatever reason because our hearts are tainted with sin. There was no handicap accessible accommodations in, in this time period. Okay, Now, at this point in our text give you a little background of where we're at exactly. Jesus has been on a mission around the region of Galilee. And we're just going to catch you up by reading a little from Mark in the previous chapter. You can follow along with me in verse 35. 
in chapter 1, says, And rising very early in the morning, while it was dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking to you. And he said to them, Let's go out to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came. And he went out through all of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. And a leper came to him, imploring him and kneeling to him, and said, If you wish, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him, and sent him away at once, and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone. Now why would Jesus do that? He just healed him, miraculously. But he says, Don't tell anyone what's happened. But go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded, for a proof to them. But the man with leprosy went out and began to talk freely about it. As I'm sure we all would if we were miraculously healed from some affirmity. Look at what Jesus did for me. Have you heard about what Jesus can do? We would be shouting it at the top of our lungs. And he began freely talking about it and spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. He couldn't go into the town because the crowds were impending on his ability to minister. So he would go on to the outskirts and they would come out to him. We read in this text a similar thing happening. Jesus, if you go back in Matthew, has been to Gerasia. Remember the account of the Gerasene demoniac where Jesus cast out the demons and they went into the swine and they ran off the cliff and went into the sea? This happened here. And what did those people do? They threw him out. Kit out. So, Jesus, in our text this morning, crossed over, got into a boat, and came back to Capernaum, his hometown. Now we know Jesus grew up in Nazareth, but they rejected him also. Remember? So he moves his ministry headquarters to Capernaum. And it said, in a home. And it was likely Simon, Peter, and Andrew's home. And Jesus was there. The crowds heard about it. They heard about him healing throughout Galilee, his ministry, healing the leper. They heard about him casting out demons. And they come by the hundreds to Simon Peter's house. And they've packed the place. And from Judea... It says that, and from Jerusalem, it says that Pharisees and scribes had come and were there. The crowd was sitting there. It was packed. They couldn't get even in through the doors. And Jesus is trying to minister. What is the temperament of the crowd, do you think? Let's say that I've been healed miraculously by some man, and I give testimony to it. You've known me all my life, and, and I've been blind all my life, and now I can see. And I tell you about this man. This man is, is preaching good news. He's preaching a message of salvation. And this man's going to be here this morning. Does the crowd come to hear what he has to say, or does the crowd come to see what he can do? That's really the problem with this crowd. They're a fickle bunch. Yeah, Jesus is preaching everywhere, but His popularity isn't because of what He's saying. It's because of what He can do and what He has demonstrated He can do. These miraculous healings. They only want to see a show. I wonder, would we be any different? Would we be fickle like they are? That's a kind of a sad question to ask when we really think about it. Now, as Christians, if it were Jesus, we'd want to hear what He had to say. We'd like to see the healings too. Right? It also says that the Jewish leaders were there. Now, why do you suppose they were there? 
if, if Jesus were given a title as a minister in Judaism, he would be given the title of scribe. He's not a Pharisee. He's not a Sadducee. He's a scribe. He's a rabbi. He's a teacher of the law. Okay? So Pharisees and scribes were there in Peter's house in Capernaum, and they were sitting there to hear what Jesus was going to teach. They had heard about the miracles too. So here come this group of men. Now, I don't know how big the group of men were, but it was more than four. It was more than five. It was a group, but there were four that were carrying this man on what we would think of as a stretcher or a litter, as I learned in Boy Scouts. You know, you take a, a, a blanket, you roll up the ends, you stick two poles in each side, and you can carry a man on that on all four corners. And this is what was happening. They, they brought this guy, this paralytic, who John MacArthur says wants to be healed for his sins, but he's been paralyzed. We don't know why. He could have been born that way. There could have been an accident. But nonetheless, they bring him out of faith in what they have in Jesus. They've heard about what he can do, and they get to the house, and it's packed. There's no way to get into Jesus. All these houses in this culture, though, were built primarily two-story and there was a porch outside or a great room upstairs, like what we find in the Last Supper. And there are stairways leading to the roof on all the homes in this, in this time period. And so these four men take this paralytic to the top of the roof. And you can imagine Jesus is sitting underneath this room and people are all around him. And all of a sudden stuff, stuff starts falling from the ceiling. You know, he's teaching the gospel. He's sharing the good news. The crowd is probably really intense and in listening to what he has to say, and all of a sudden stuff, stuff stops dropping on their heads. I, I think that would have been kind of an interruption. You know, there would have been great attention drawn to what was going on up, or, up ahead. And, and Luke says that they removed the tiles. And they would have had to remove a lot of tiles to drop a litter down. But that's what they do. They have so much faith in what Jesus can do for their friend that they're willing to tear up this house, bypass the crowd, and put him at the feet of Jesus. And that's exactly what they do. And when Jesus sees their faith, he's deeply moved. Anytime Jesus sees the faith of people, he's deeply moved. He even heals when people don't have faith. He'll say, so that you may have faith. But when he sees people are faithful, he's deeply moved, and he immediately reacts, and he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and scribes are like, what did we just hear? Only God can forgive sins. What's this guy, what's this guy saying? Well, where does his authority come from? He's claiming to have God-like powers. Only God can forgive sins. And in their hearts, they're crying out, you're a blasphemer. They don't say a word, but Jesus, being God, being all-knowing, Scripture tells us, knows the thoughts of their heart. And, and in that culture, the heart and the mind were the same thing. So He knows what they're thinking. He says, what? Why are you thinking these evil things about me? Why, why are these evil thoughts plaguing your mind? Jesus just forgave the man of his sins. He wasn't doing anything wrong. He was God. They didn't know that. They didn't believe that. But he says, so let me ask you a question. Which is easier, to forgive this man's sins or for him to be physically healed? I don't say a word, because only God can forgive sins and only God can miraculously heal. One's not any easier than the other. Only God can do both. Now, he's already claimed to be able to forgive sins. Let me ask you, if your sins are forgiven, can I verify that? Can I see evidence of the fact that your sins are forgiven? Can I really know looking at Linda, that her sins have been forgiven because Jesus said so? It takes faith, doesn't it? 
I have to believe it in my heart. I can't verify it. I can't see evidence of it. Now, I can see it in her life because her life changes. All of our lives changes. And we'll get to that. But I can't have any kind of empirical evidence to know that any of our sins have been forgiven. I have to take it on faith. But Jesus says, so that you know that the Son of Man, which by the way is a messianic title from Daniel chapter 7, where all the authority of heaven and earth are given to the Son of Man, and His dominion, His kingdom reigns forever. It's a messianic title. He says, so that you may know the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. He turns around to the paralytic and he says, I tell you, get up, pick up your mat, and go home. And immediately, the guy jumps up. There's no physical therapy involved here. It's an immediate, miraculous healing. Can you imagine the muscle atrophy that this guy has? He's a paralytic on a cot. His muscles haven't moved. You know, I don't know whether he has a... Ter it says palsy in the King James Version. Okay, Have you ever seen anybody with severe palsy? I bring a little boy to school every day that has severe palsy to the point that they give him, uh, uh, what's that injection that they give ladies in their, in their Botox. Botox? They give him Botox injections in his neck so that he isn't constantly going, and I mean, the little guy's ears and his nose virtually will get bleeding. He rubs so hard against his wheelchair. But he gets Botox injections. This is the type of palsy I want you to imagine that Jesus immediately heals this guy from. He has no control of his muscles. And immediately he jumps up, he grabs his mat, and he goes home praising God in front of everybody. He's praising God and the crowd is astonished. Now I'm assuming the crowd means the Pharisees and the scribes too. He's just gave evidence that he can forgive sins... He said so, and he backs it up with a miraculous healing. Only God can do both. So he has the authority. And they say, this is the part that really bothers me. Going back, to, I want to get it right. They say, everyone was amazed and gave God praise who had given such authority to men. They missed it. They still think that Jesus is just a man. They praise God for giving this man the authority to do this miracle. They still don't buy that he can forgive sins. They still don't buy it. They praise God as they should, and so does the paralytic. But the scribes and Pharisees, I imagine, are still furious. Because he's claiming to be God. Now, how does this apply to us? <laughs> it's very simple, really. Jesus has given us his ministry. When he left this earth, he told the disciples, and it's recorded in Matthew chapter 28. He said, Jesus said to them, came to them and said, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. And then he's saying, You. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. See, in this text this morning, Jesus has demonstrated His authority over heaven. He forgives sins. Sins aren't something tangibly that we can see. They are. <laughs> but what I'm saying is the account, the, the red ledger isn't something we can verify is being held against us in heaven or separating us from God. We have to faithfully believe that. And we have to faithfully believe that Jesus has that authority. He's demonstrated it in this text this morning. We also see that Jesus has the power, the authority on earth. He was able to recreate or heal this man's infirmities. 
in an instant. He just says, get up, take your mat, and go home. In an instant, the guy does it. Also on display is Jesus' omniscience as God. The Pharisees had to wonder, how did he know we thought he was blaspheming? How did he know what our thoughts were? How did he know to ask us that question, which is harder to do? Heal, forgive sins or heal the physical? Heal the spiritual or heal the physical? Only God can do both. How did he know to ask us that very question? Or he couldn't say anything. Only God can understand what's in a man's heart. Only God can understand what our thoughts are. And He does understand. I want to tell you, regardless of what your thoughts are, you can be honest with God. He already knows. We spend so much time... I mean, think about it, honestly. Every one of us spends so much time denying what we know to be true to ourselves. We tell ourselves a lie. Oh, I, I really don't feel this way. When we really do. Oh, I, re I really don't doubt this. I, I know it to be true. But we really do doubt it. So in the process of doubting ourselves, or, or fooling ourselves, we try to fool God too, and we don't bring it to Him. When we try to fool ourselves, we, by consequence, try to fool God too. And He knows better. We know better. So be honest with God. He has the authority to deal with your spiritual issues. He has the authority to deal with your physical issues. Now what I want to tell you is, the physical issues, that's for our next life, when we're given a perfected body. Because just like they believed in that culture that sin and physical infirmities go together, they still do. We have it genetically in us since the fall of man to die. We will all die because of sin. The penalty, the wages of sin is death. And we've all inherited that. There's no getting around it. Okay? It's a reality of life. But as a Christian, as a follower of Christ who has authority on earth and has authority in heaven, we can take heart in knowing that He has conquered sin, He has conquered death, and He can recreate us as we were intended to be. With this authority demonstrated by Jesus, and what I read you from Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission, we are commanded to carry on the work of Jesus, making disciples of Him. That's the key to that verse. Go is the verb, but the purpose is to make disciples. Disciples of who? Disciples of Christ. Not of ourselves. We're to make disciples of Jesus. And He tells us how to do it. You go out, you baptize them, and you teach them obedience to what I've taught you. Pretty simple. You go get them, you baptize them, and you teach them. That's what we're supposed to do. Mark adds to it in his gospel account. He writes to the church in Rome. He says, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Is that the same as what Matthew said? <coughs> yeah, kind of. But the next verse he says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe, will be condemned. When you take those two verses and compare it to the Great Commission, they really mesh. And since we have established the correlation of testimony, of Jesus' authority, Mark, Matthew, Luke, they all give us this account. And Matthew and Mark give us an account of Jesus' command. God's law says there has to be two or more witnesses, and we have that in Scripture. We have two or more witnesses to give Jesus' authority credibility. And since we have that, we can go out and share the truth. Because it's verifiable. It's credible. 
And while we can't likely demonstrate immediate physical healing, we can demonstrate forgiveness of sin. You realize that? You have the ability to demonstrate Jesus' authority over sin. When we repent, when we turn, and we follow Christ, I mean, really follow Christ, deny ourselves, pick up our own cross, that demonstration is evident in what we say and what we do. We're changed. When Christ takes away sin and we are forgiven, we are changed. We are a new creature. And the evidence of His authority over sin is demonstrated in us. And when we have that, and people can see it in our lives, they ask questions. And we can bring them to the point where the Holy Spirit can change their heart and that forgiveness of sin can be demonstrated in their life. I don't think we give enough credit to Jesus' authority to forgive sins. We're all about the visible, right? What we can see is easier to believe than what we can't see. But which is more important? Which is the, which is the root cause? It's sin. Eliminate sin... Eliminate the burden from it all. That is the greatest characteristic of Christianity, the forgiveness of sin. And through the forgiveness of sin, through the shed blood of Christ on the cross, we can be healed spiritually and we can be healed physically. <coughs> when you are going through a trial or a test in life, and I mean God allows it to come head on. When you try to battle it all by yourself, and you try to deny the problem or put it off, and it may or may not be as a result to sin, but when you try to do it yourself, it's overwhelming. Jesus has the authority. He has the authority and the ability to get us through it. He carries the burden for us. All we have to do is be honest with Him and allow Him to, to carry that burden. I'm going to challenge you all this morning to, to think about what it is in your life that you're fooling yourself about. We all have these areas that we're trying to deny. And in doing so, we try to fool God. We try to deny the issue with our Heavenly Father who is all-knowing. I think when we do that, we're doubly sinning. We're continuing in our problem and we're lying to God. And just be honest with Him. Now, how many of you have this image of God as this great being looking down from heaven waiting to strike us with a lightning bolt whenever we mess up? Do any of you think of God that way? A lot of people do. That is not God. God is one who allows consequence because of sin so that we might freely choose to love Him. Think about what it is that separates you from God. Turn it over to Him this morning. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for Your Word. I'm thankful that Jesus came and ministered, that He demonstrated His authority over heaven, over earth. Father, that we have the evidence in Your Word, testimony of so many, that can verify His death, and His resurrection, the power that He has over death, the power that He has over sin. Those two main elements, Father, that we can't make right ourselves without His loving sacrifice. And so we're grateful for that. Father, I thank You this morning for 
all these saints that have chosen to be here, that have chosen to place their faith in you. Sometimes, Father, we do it reluctantly. Sometimes we doubt. And Father, you love us through all of that. You find ways to restore a broken relationship through Jesus every time. Help us, Father, in our unbelief. Father, provide us with answers to questions that plague us. Allow us time, Father, to be alone with you so that we might hear you speak through prayer and through your word. Father, I know we're all so very busy in this life, but there's so much more at stake than just our happiness temporarily. There's so much more at stake than just seeking out temporary joy. Father, we have an eternity of bliss awaiting us. Help us to remember that and hold on to that reward, that promise that you have for us. God, I thank you so much for this church family. I thank you so much that we're close and that we can lean on one another in times of hardship. Father, help us to always feel comfortable with one another and show love to one another so that we might be the light that shines in this community. Father, prepare our hearts now as we take time to reflect on Calvary, knowing full well that that's what made the forgiveness of sin possible. Help us to remember how much Jesus suffered, how much He loved us, how much You loved us. And continue to love us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Knock, knock, guys.